Back to you again, dear Morocco AI audience. We hope you have had a wonderful day with our amazing speakers and panelists. And we are very excited to have you all here tonight with a very special guest, our honorary speaker of the conference, Professor Joshua Benjou. I think he needs no introduction from all of us. You don't need me to present Joshua Benjou, but I'm just going to give you a very, very brief introduction about him. So Joshua Benjou, uh, is a full professor at Université de Montréal and the founder of Mila, one of the best AI institutes in the world. He is recognized worldwide as one of the leading experts in AI who received the Turing Award. Uh, this is equivalent to the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. We have to know also that Joshua Benjo is the second most cited computer scientist in the world. One thing that maybe you don't know is that Joshua Benjo had the opportunity to lead many great AI companies, but he chose to stay in academia to get more freedom and to talk more about interesting subject like the one he will give in tonight. Of course, tonight here in Morocco. So without any further ado, for not being over time, I will say please welcome everyone, Professor Joshua Benjo. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohamed, and thank you for the organizers to uh, have invited me for this uh, lecture in your um, Morocco AI conference. Um, I would like to tell you about the main research program that my group uh, at Mila is working on. And um, I think of it as potentially the next step beyond deep learning as we know it to bridge the gap between what's currently the state of the art in machine learning and human intelligence. So I'm gonna to try to explain um, you know, what is that gap? And you'll see that a lot of what I talk about, what I talk about is taking inspiration from what humans can do that current machine learning is not good at in order to design the next generation of machine learning systems. So the title talks about cognitively inspired inductive biases for higher level cognition and systematic generalization. Inductive biases means the way we design our neural nets, the architectures, the preferences in the space of functions or in the space of distributions that the learner um, uh, exploits in order to get good generalization. And high level cognition refers to the part of our mental uh, uh, processing that we can get conscious of. So uh, everything that we can verbalize with language, for example. Systematic generalization has to do with our ability as humans to generalize in very novel ways for example, as we see it in language, to, for example, configurations of variables or configurations of words in the case of language that we have never seen, but we can understand the meaning because it, its composition, it's a composition of meanings of things we already know, right? All right. So at more of a theoretical level, what, uh, is important to understand is all of learning theory in machine learning is based on an assumption that is typically not true. That assumption is that all the examples are sampled from the same distribution or more precisely, uh, the test cases are supposed to come from the same distribution as the training data. Unfortunately, that is not uh, you know, what's going on in, in the real world. Um, the test cases might be from a different distribution because the world changes or we train with data from say one country and then we apply this in a different country. As a consequence, our state-of-the-art AI systems um, on paper, like you know, in laboratory tests, sometimes work really well, but then when you deploy them, they might not be so robust. Okay, so 
if we're going to drop, drop the IID assumption, the assumption that all the examples come from the same distribution, um, we need some other assumptions because if there is no assumption, then, well, why should we even expect to get generalization? Like if the test cases are from some arbitrary distribution, then the error made by the predictor could be arbitrarily bad, right? And humans are able to deal with that. So maybe we can get inspiration from, from, from the brains of humans and, and what we know about human cognition. This also raises questions about, uh, you know, so what are the assumptions we can make about how distributions change? And how is knowledge organized for humans and, you know, potentially machines in the future? We already know how knowledge is kind of organized in, in uh, modern deep learning. Uh, it's not it's not an organization that's easy to make sense of, but we 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 kind of understand the big picture. The way that humans organize knowledge uh, at a conscious level, however, is quite different, as I'll explain. Now, there is something interesting here, which is how do humans manage to provide good decisions <clears throat> in settings where there's a big change in distribution. Um, for example, you, you have been driving all your life uh, with, uh, you know, on the right side of the road and suddenly you go to a country where you rent a car and uh, you have to drive on the left side of the road. Now, what happens in those situations? It's it, interesting to think about it, right? So what happens is, you cannot just drive in your habitual way. Otherwise, you're going to make an accident. What happens in those situations is that humans uh, who don't make an accident um, are very attentive. They pay attention to what is going on, and they pay attention to the new rules. Like here, oh, you have to drive on the left. And we do that all the time. Um, and that allows us to somehow face those challenges. So that's interesting because it, it tells us something about how to solve the problem of changes in distribution, at least the way that humans do it. And I think a good source of inspiration to better understand how you know these two different styles of cognition uh, look like is the uh, book by Daniel Kahneman, who won a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in economics uh, for his work. Uh, which is really about cognitive science, uh, but he applied it in, in, in the context of uh, behavioral economics. And what he says is that, and I mean, it's not just him, it's there's a lot of work in, in, in cognitive science that we recognize in neuroscience as well, that there seems to be different ways of computing in the brain, uh, which roughly you can distinguish as the unconscious and the conscious part. So the unconscious is intuitive. It's it's what we put in the category that he calls system one, whereas the conscious is more um, something um, uh, explicit and that you can verbalize, and we put in the category of system two. Uh, and roughly speaking, you could say that current deep learning is more like system one. Uh, it's very fast in the sense that you know you just go fast forward in in, uh, in in a deep net and you know in, in 10 or 20 steps you're done um, it's very parallel whereas if you introspect about your uh, conscious cognition you can see it's, it's very slow uh, it's very sequential but so what's the advantage of the system too it's because it allows you to manipulate concepts like those we use words for um, in a, in a way that uh, has more flexibility, that allows you to generalize to new configurations of these concepts. So in my driving example, um, even if I've never driven on the left, I kind of understand what it means because I understand you know, what it means to drive on one side or the other side. Uh, it's just that I don't have the habit uh, of doing it, right? So the system two can even teach the system one. All right. Um, let's uh, move forward. And how does that relate to current work in uh, deep learning? Um, there's a fast growing movement in the machine learning community 
to incorporate ideas, not just from cognitive science, but also from causality. Because pretty much everything we've done in machine learning up to now was about learning about joint distributions, but not necessarily thinking about cause and effect. And it turns out that there are some subtle differences here. I mean, according to uh, Yuda Pearl, who uh, got a Turing Award also for his work on causality, uh, it's a fundamental difference, uh, you know, and this is debated, but the point is our current architectures, our current ways of doing things in machine learning um, could probably be improved if we incorporated some ideas from causality. And the connection with what I just said is that if we understand the world in a causal way, decomposing the law knowledge into these pieces corresponding to causal mechanisms, like in physics, for example, uh, we might be able to uh, do these out of distribution generalization um, because we understand how things work uh, even in circumstances that are very different from uh, what you know we have data for. Um, another really interesting thing about causality is that it's really focused on the notion of intervention. Uh, in other words, essentially abstract actions. Um, so this is a theme that I'll come back to. Um, now, traditional work in causality assumes that we observe the causal variables, the random variables that are supposed to be cause and effect. And, and then we can do causal inference, like decide whether, uh, to what extent A is cause of B and compared to other causes and so on. But in machine learning, think about applications like robotics, uh, we don't get to see the causal variables directly. We get to see images. We get to see sensory data. So, so what you see in the slide on the right is really we have a new challenge, which is jointly learning um, a, an encoder and decoder that, that maps back and forth from low level input or outputs and um, the causal level, the system two level, the the uh, entities that we manipulate consciously. Um, and that's the level where we have a causal structure that we would like to discover. But, but we don't directly observe these random variables. OK, so there are lots of questions about how we might be able to do something like this. And it's still an open problem. And today, I'm going to give you a glimpse about what we're doing uh, in my group towards that. But first, to understand why is it that if we understand these causal mechanisms, we could generalize to new settings? Think about um, physics, like you know gravity, for example. Um, even though the laws of physics are the same on uh, Earth and the Moon, pictures on Earth look very different than on the Moon. So if you train you know, with uh, pictures from Earth, and then you try to generalize from pictures from the moon, it might be difficult. But if you think about it from a causal perspective, uh, what it says is that um, it's not really the joint distribution we care about. I mean, we do, of course, but, but there is something about how that distribution is structured that tells us about how the world works. It's like there's a dynamical system that controls like, like the laws of physics that that decide, you know, given some initial conditions, this is how things would unfold. And if we understand that those causal mechanisms, those dynamics, then we can apply them even in settings corresponding to conditions that we've never seen, right? We just apply that machinery and it tells us how the world would transform under different conditions. If you think about how we make sense of a science fiction scenario, it's the same thing. You know, it's, it's maybe an impossible setting but you know, given what we know about how the world works and maybe some new hypotheses, like we could travel faster than light or something, we can, we can understand how the story would unfold. Um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me skip this. Um, there is a, a starting point for a lot of my work in this area, which is to ask the question of what we call inductive biases. In other words, assumptions about the world which might be relevant, in particular for the system two level. And so we, we already have inductive biases, for example, with convolutional nets. Um, but maybe we need a different kind of inductive biases for 
um, the verbalizable stuff, the, the consciously manipulated concepts. And um, I'm trying to lay out what these inductive biases could be. Um, so the one that I first really worked on in a paper in uh, 2017 called the consciousness prior is about the sparseness of the dependencies between those uh, high level variables. In other words, Think about a sentence like, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. Well, there are very few entities involved. So the dependency that is being specified here involves just like, you know, the ball position, the hand, the action of dropping or not, and, and, and that's it, right? Then the change in the ball position. So very few things. Um, and it says that at the abstract level, the representations we are seeking at this high level have this property. It's a very special property. It says that we can predict things from very few other things. Um, another property is that th these entities play a causal role. Uh, you know, you can do counterfactuals, like if I had dropped the ball, you know, it would have fallen on the ground. It didn't happen, it won't happen, but I can imagine how it, it you know, what would happen. So that's, that's uh, uh, because those variables, have, you know, can play the role of cause, effect, agent, action and so on um, another really important property is that these um, relationships between the high level variables uh, in addition to being causal are reusable so what does that mean it means that the same type of relationship like dropping something could be applied to a ball or could be applied to a phone right so the same relationships uh, the same mechanism can be applied to many, many different uh, arguments, many different types of arguments. And that means this, you know, this sharing of parameters here that's going on. And that is very important from a machine learning point of view. It means we have to structure our models so that maybe on the fly we can decide, okay, so there is this mechanism about dropping that is going to be applied now to these objects. Um, and this reusability gives us an ability to generalize out of distribution, uh, to generalize in a systematic way, just like we do in language. So for example, if I say, uh, instead of the previous sentence, if I say, if I had dropped the Zog, and you don't know what a Zog is before, uh, it would have fallen on the ground. Well, you can deduce all kinds of things here. Like the Zog is something I can hold in my hand. It's probably an object. Um, so that's pretty constrained already. Um, and, and that's because those uh, mechanisms like dropping and the context here as a person dropping, um, the, these mechanisms can be, only be employed in particular contexts where the arguments have particular types. And so uh, we can generalize to things we don't know, like the Zog here. Uh, quite easily because of all these constraints. And we can replace objects by other objects. We can create new combinations of these concepts and so on. So that's systematic generalization, really. There's another inductive bias, which is less obvious from a cognitive perspective, but at least it's a good hypothesis. Uh, it looks like a lot of what we think about, not necessarily everything, is has been discretized. In other words, you know, we can verbalize uh, our thoughts, not all our thoughts. Like you can have visual thoughts, but not always easy to verbalize. But but a lot of our thoughts can be verbalized through things like words, so symbols, abstract concepts that are discrete. And of course, language is all about that. Now, a a more specific hypothesis about how this may happen in the brain is uh, that uh, when different parts of the brain communicate with each other, um, they exchange information through a bottleneck, which this is a, a, an established theory in cognitive science called the global workspace theory. But in addition to having this bottleneck of communication, there could be an extra bottleneck in that communication due to discretization. And so in other words, the information is reduced, not just like less items, but each item is now something uh, that require less bits. And that could be interesting from a generalization perspective as well, because 
if um, the different parts of the brain communicate with each other through a kind of language, um, that means they can easily be replaced by one another, right? That, you know, they are like hot swappable, as we say in um, engineering. Um, and so, for example, I can replace a noun by another in a sentence, just like I did in my previous example. Um, another really important assumption that uh, makes a lot of sense um, for humans is that the changes in distribution that are due to these actions that we call interventions uh, that can change some property of an object, like it can push the object here, I can drop it. And when we try to understand changes in distribution at, at a conscious level, we try to attribute those changes to a single variable that has been intervened, right? So he opened the door or um, she said something, you know, terrible. Um, so, so this is a very strong assumption, right? It says that the, um, the, the action space at, at the abstract level, at least, um, is very sparse that our typical actions touch only one variable. And of course, this variable may cause a lot of side effects, uh, but that could be a very useful um, inductive bias when we are learning about uh, how things change, but also learning about high level representations of policies, of actions. Okay, um, let, me, let me say a few more words uh, about specific papers uh, that we've been involved with um, uh, in that line of work. So there is um, um, a uh, iClear 2020 paper, uh, which is um, uh, really one of the first papers in my group about causality. So you see it's not that old, um, that is exploiting this sparsity of interventions that the the changes are happening due to maybe just one variable being modified or one mechanism being modified. Um, and, um, and, and, and you can use that in order to figure out the causal structure. Um, uh, we generalize this uh, and others as well, generalize this to uh, the case where the graph is, is larger. It's not, so in the original paper it was just two variables. Uh, and that has been generalized to larger graphs, which poses all kinds of uh, 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 interesting uh, challenges. Um, basically, the structure in these papers is we have neural nets that represent conditional distributions corresponding to one variable given its parents. And we jointly learn those neural net parameters, as well as the structure of the graph that says which, which variable are the direct parents of which variables. And uh, we, we do it in such a way that those discrete choices uh, are transformed into probabilistic soft choices. Like what's the probability that A is a direct parent of B? Um, and so we learn this probability matrix of the uh, adjacency uh, matrix of the causal graph. Um, a more recent, uh, paper that's now, that's an archive. Uh, it, I mean, there's a new version this year on the same subject there. Um, it explores how, if the learner actively decides what the interventions might be, then uh, it, it can learn more efficiently. And that's, it's, uh, there's some, something with the precision of that slide here, but on top you use active interventions where you, you use some uh, kind of estimate of how much information will I gain by doing that intervention. And then we observe the change in distribution and we can update our causal graph uh, distribution. Whereas the blue was what we were doing before. We just are passively observing these changes. And from that, we can infer things about the structure of the graph. Um, we've also played with attention mechanisms in, in a series of papers that started with this um, I clear 2021, well, actually the original paper, it was an archive in 2019 called Recurrent Independent Mechanisms. Um, and 
the idea here is instead of having one fully connected you know, big network here, this is a recurrent net, we break the, the network inspired by theories of uh, neuroscience into little modules that are, you know, inside each module is like a normal neural net, a normal recurrent net. But the way that these modules communicate with each other is constrained with, with a communication bottleneck. And so we have a series of ways of doing these bottlenecks. Um, we use attention mechanisms to decide on the fly. This is a dynamic connection, you know, which module is going to be speaking to which module. Um, in this variant of, uh, of the RIMS, um, which, is, which is an archive, um, uh, we, we use the notion of a workspace. So in other words, the modules, they can't talk to each other directly, but what happens is they talk through a, uh, a blackboard, if you want, uh, through a, a working memory. And uh, only one or very few modules are allowed to write in this memory this working memory, but all the modules can read from it. And, and we find that this helps out of distribution generalization. Um, we also have a more recent paper along similar lines called the uh, neural production systems, um, where we use the same kind of attention mechanism to decide on the fly, which neural net, which you can think of representing a rule is gonna be applied to the current content of the working memory and then write new uh, content into the working memory, modify the working memory. Uh, so there's competition between those rules and there's also competition between the, the elements of the working memory which you can think of slots for you know which one is going to um, be selected as an argument of these rules which are which are soft rules or neural nets small neural nets uh, there's another recent paper where we introduced this discreteness uh, that i mentioned earlier i won't go into the detail uh I, by the way i think this one is uh a, it was presented at the last NeurIPS. Um, all right, so I'm almost at the end of my presentation and I'm going to now look a little bit forward in um, uh, towards where we want to go next. So what kinds of tools do we need uh, moving forward to incorporate these system two abilities into deep learning? So we've already explored modularity and we've started to explore causality, but we haven't like, for example, bring these two things together. But there are other really exciting things that um, these new style of deep learning might be able to do. And that is learning to reason and to plan. We have a, a Europe's paper on uh, system two sort of conscious like um, uh, planning, uh, which you can have a look at. But the more general problem of how well, both understanding how humans imagine and plan and reason and uh, how we could implement that in, in neural nets is, is what's occupying most of, uh, of my work these days. Um, if you compare with the classical work in AI, which was also about reasoning and planning and things like that, it was all based on search. Uh, search that is intractable, basically, in a high dimensional space, these search problems um, of finding the right combination of like rules and facts and so on to prove uh, a theorem, for example, or to find a good move in, in, a, in chess, um, they, they, they grow exponentially, right? And, and brains don't seem to be doing this kind of exhaustive search. Instead, what's much more plausible for brains is that they generate good candidates. We have good ideas, solutions to problems that pop up in our mind. Now, these are intuitive. They're produced in an intuitive way. They're not always coherent. So when they pop up in our mind, we can check them for coherence. So it's like we have two systems. We have the intuitive generation of ideas, thoughts, imagined possibilities, imagined solutions, imagined plans. And then we have this sort of checker that can see if they are consistent with each other. And if they're, if the pieces of this proposal are consistent with each other, and if they're not, then they can be rejected basically. And, and okay, no, this idea won't work. I see that there's a problem, right? Um, and it, it, it also uses attention because such an idea is composed of parts and choosing which relation between those parts uh, form the idea. Um, and, and so there's a, a notion of discrete choices here involved in coming up with the idea in the first place. Um, 
Right. So I talked about classical AI. Um, in, in a way, what we're trying to do tries to get the best of both worlds, right? We, we want to avoid the pitfalls of classical AI, uh, rule-based symbol manipulation. Uh, we want to keep the advantages uh, uh, of current deep learning that it has against classical AI. We want efficient large-scale learning. We want to be able to ground these higher level decisions in low level perception. So this is like symbol grounding uh, and be able to also represent knowledge that is not easily put into a formal like language-like form, implicit knowledge. System one knowledge needs to be part of it. Um, we, we want to keep this idea of having distributed representations for uh, for entities, because that buys us so much power of generalization. Like this is why current natural language processing based on deep learning is so good. It's it's in great part because of this. Uh, uh, which, by the way, I I uh, contributed to in a Europe's two thousand paper on neural language models, and um, yeah. Um, we want to replace the exhaustive kind of search with something more efficient where machine learning learns to generate good candidates. We also need to keep um, notions of uncertainty that are not necessarily easy to incorporate in, in the classical AI. But we want to also uh, benefit from some of the advantages of the classical AI approaches like systematic generalization, decomposing knowledge into small exchangeable pieces, being able to manipulate variables, instances, references, and indirection. All right, I'm done, and I'll be happy to answer questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Isha Benju, for this amazing talk, as always. I would like just to say, if you can just, je vais juste parler en français, si vous pouvez juste passer un message en français à notre communauté Morocco AI qui est en train de suivre votre exposé. Elle était en train d'attendre depuis très longtemps. Mais ça, ça me fait très plaisir de, de parler à votre audience et je veux leur dire que euh, c'est important pour, pour le Maroc, c'est important pour euh, les pays en voie de développement en général de, euh, de foncer dans cette direction. Parce que... Euh, bah, il, une grande partie de la croissance économique, je pense, dans les prochaines décennies, va, va dépendre de, de ces technologies. Et il y a moyen de, enfin, il faut être optimiste, disons, et j'y crois, euh, de, de tirer parti des outils comme de communication, ce qui nous permet aujourd'hui de nous parler, euh, d'accéder à, à, à toute la littérature, etc., pour, euh, pour développer un écosystème d'intelligence artificielle, des entreprises, des startups. Euh, des, une communauté scientifique euh, qui, qui va vraiment aider la société, euh, pas seulement au niveau économique, parce que l'intelligence artificielle, c'est quelque chose qui peut nous aider euh, euh, dans, dans, dans la société euh, plus largement que l'économie, par exemple dans la santé, l'éducation, l'environnement. Alors, euh, je pense que c'est extraordinaire de sentir l'énergie qui, qui se développe euh, au Maroc. Et puis, j'encourage euh, tout le monde à, à, à continuer à pousser dans cette direction. Merci, merci beaucoup, euh, cher professeur Benjou, euh, de nous avoir fait l'honneur euh, d'être parmi nous euh, à Morocco AI. Et j'espère que vous serez avec nous euh, l'année prochaine, euh, cette fois-ci en présentiel et non pas en ligne. Encore une fois, merci pour tout ce que vous faites pour la communauté AI au monde et aussi pour les pays en voie de développement. Merci beaucoup. Avec plaisir.